I was what women call a late bloomer and men call a prude. <laughs> I didn't have sex until my senior year of college. I didn't know how to masturbate. I didn't figure it out. I didn't try to. I thought, if I don't know what sex feels like, what good is it going to do me to try to create that same feeling for myself? Once I discovered dry humping, I was content with that. <laughs> I didn't want to actually have sex. It was so daunting. My mom had raised me believing that sex was naughty and not in the good way. It was bad. It was something for trashy, depraved people unless you were married. When I was a freshman in high school, a tale circulated of a girl classmate who had sex with her junior boyfriend in his truck. In this anecdote, she screamed so loudly that all the windows in his truck shattered. <laughs> the girl in question later told me, no, no, no. What had actually happened was that she was indeed screaming, but she was flailing around in delight from the great sex, and she accidentally kicked her foot through the windshield. <laughs> The clarification was no relief to me and still made sex seem incredibly dangerous. So in my first year of college, I was dry grinding, so dignified, with the guy I was hanging out with when he wanted to have sex with me and I told him no. He reassured me that it was okay, we didn't have to do the penis and the vagina stuff, that we could do something else <laughs> to give each other pleasure. He looked at me with a fabricated, sexy look <laughs> as he slid downwards and said, I know ways. <laughs> I knew he meant oral sex, but this presentation of his supposed talents, this slimy goading, did not turn me on. I laughed, and I left. <laughs> I returned to my friends and told them the story, and for the next few years, it just became our go-to joke. Can anybody help me with geology? I know ways. <laughs> <laughs> My car won't start, you guys. I know ways. <laughs> I feel like if I could just throw up, I'd feel better. I know ways. <laughs> I had that guy in mind for a while. Every time I thought of sex and men, men as sleaze buckets and my mom's admonitions of premarital sex being the activity of wretched people who didn't deserve love and the thoughts of getting wounded by shards of glass. They all hovered in my mind. Guys kept dumping me and calling me prude when I wouldn't fuck them or at least give them a blowjob or a courtesy handy. Finally, I got an actual boyfriend. It worked out well for me because we met in the UK just as I was days from leaving. I hit it off with Rich, an artist. We kissed and then when I got back to the States, we got to know each other through correspondence. There was no pressure for sex. Our relationship grew the old-fashioned way, in love letters, before internet temptations to play detective existed, before incessantly checking for an email reply kept a person chained to a computer, much less a phone, and when daily international phone calls were still too expensive to be a feasible option. We would exchange letters and photos and plan our monthly phone calls. When Rich came for an in-person visit, I was ready to have actual sex because that was quite a lot of foreplay. <laughs> no more outer course for this gal. I was in love. I wasn't scared, and purity be damned, I went for it. It was really great. I loved it, and I knew what felt good and why. So we continued occasional visits. It was really good when we did have sex, but there was something in our sex life that seemed to be missing, even aside from regularity. Sound. I didn't know what sounds to make. <laughs> what words to say out loud. My only reference was film and TV. And I knew I shouldn't trust that. <laughs> Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for that laugh. Uh, my fellow Seinfeld fans in the house. <laughs> I thought, surely I'll learn in time from my boyfriend. But a long distance relationship with in-person visits every few months can only last so long. After that, there was Sam, a beefy, smart, but immature rugby player. We were getting a yeah, mm. <laughs> 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 We 
were getting hot and heavy on his couch one day while Basic Instinct played on TV. <laughs> Yeah, it got things going. I was taking note of his oohs and his oh yes, but then I heard ooh, hold on, hold on, as he climbed off of me to watch the scene in which Sharon Stone uncrosses her legs. <laughs> I left. There was Chris, a bleached platinum cool New York City musician. Things were escalating in his bed when he suddenly, purposefully, tightened his lips over mine and burped into my mouth. <laughs> He fell over laughing. I felt it coming up, but I just had to do it, he said. I left. I wasn't learning anything about proper bedroom talk. I met Tom, an aspiring filmmaker who became my boyfriend, and I finally learned true dirty talk. Not only did I learn it, I was inspired to create it. He was so into talking filthy that it got me going, got me hot, and had phrases pouring out of my mouth that I never thought I could speak. I got into watching porn because of and for him. I became a sexter. <laughs> <laughs> this had all gone ridiculously beyond some nasty little pillow talk. We were together for several years, but over time, I grew kind of weary. Our relationship was falling apart. I became frustrated with sexting, trying to use one hand to complete business and the other hand to text. Have you ever seen phones from 2006? <laughs> I was increasingly turned off by the porn, the misogyny of women being held and kept down. I was getting angry with all of Tom's dirty talk. The stuff I'd been wanting to engage in for so long now felt like a slap in the face. You like it, whore? Are you my dirty slut? Beg me for it, you little cunt. I wanted to think of equivalent names to call him, but I couldn't. Yeah, I like it, you little shithead. <laughs> I don't know, try calling a guy a filthy slut in bed as a woman and see if you're taken seriously. <laughs> a sense of lost respect slowly washed over me. Maybe the respect was never there. The frustrations were symptoms of enormous problems. Commitment, abandonment, arguing, cracks in the bedrock. We crumbled into a pile of pebbles, and I left. I moved to California, where I met Stephen, a real estate agent. He loved to whisper in my ear, your boobies make my wiener hard. <laughs> <laughs> Do I really need to say I left? Um, then there was Lewis, whose simple refrain was, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> he was in tech. <laughs> These men, the noises they made, the things they said and did in the sack might have been right for them, and maybe even some other women, but not right for me. But I was learning from myself. My upbringing and my late blooming had made me so self-conscious, so worried about getting everything right that I hadn't been getting lost in the moment, which at least some of those guys had been getting right. I just wasn't enjoying it enough. So it was a cumulative process. Over the years, over the guys, over my slutting it up, I started relaxing, making my own requests, making whatever bellow, cry, phrase, or moan felt right to me, not caring what sounds the guys made. It depended on the relationship, and it just depended on me. Instead of waiting for the perfect lesson or demonstration, I just became my own noisemaker. <laughs> I've let go. <laughs> yeah. Sign that email sheet. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I've let go of the shame of my youth. I don't put pressure on myself. That's not true. Of course I do sometimes. I have not reached enlightenment. Um, but I'm usually comfortable enough to just go with the moment. Some sweet pillow talk, some hot dom stuff, some whatever floats our boats. I'm quiet when it suits me even. But I'm just going to do me. That's Jennifer Corley, everybody.